inactivity bad, injured nurses worse, and YouTube nurses horrendous. Plus, we're going to have a return visit from our good friend Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center with another Poison Center update. All of that and more, if that's what you're looking for, you found it. It's The Nursing Show. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Nursing Show. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the program this week. If you haven't already done so, you want to make sure you head over and check out the program over at nursingshow.com. And of course, if you're watching the video version of this somewhere, you can find all the video programming from The Nursing Show over at nursingshow.tv. It all heads to the same place, essentially, but there is a separate page for all the video stuff that we put out. I do want to thank all of you for that and also for all of your emails and comments that keep coming in. Keep them coming as we get The Nursing Show back up after our hiatus. I do want to remind all of you that uh, you can get a hold of me by sending those emails into nursingshow at gmail.com and we'll have some more contact information for you as we roll into the close of the show here in just a bit. But in the meantime, let's get on with our news segments. kick off things with a study out of the UK that is looking at uh, inactivity, a sedentary lifestyle, as actually being as deadly as smoking long term in patients. So, uh, you know, we've been hammering on cigarette smoking for how long in the healthcare industry? And yeah, I know there's a lot of nurses out there who smoke, um, but uh, that is something that, uh, <laughs> you know, we're seeing less and less of, I think. However, uh, now this report is saying, hey, look, sedentary lifestyles, inactivity just as deadly long term as smoking is uh, and this is something that we're all dealing with uh, we all spend a lot more time sitting down uh, than we may used to 10 years ago uh, everything's become automated increasingly uh, heck you don't even have to wind your windows down in your car anymore every car has automatic electric windows right um, so you know little bits of exercise we even used to get doing something like that are no longer there I mean you know this finger is getting all the exercise uh, so it's a problem it's a challenge challenge. Uh, you may have noticed that the nursing show after its hiatus actually came back and it's a little bit different in setup in the studio. That's because, hey, I'm not sitting in a chair anymore. I'm standing up. I've actually changed my office workspace, so I spend about half of my time standing up working at my computer. Uh, I just found, I mean, I was just getting, I gained a lot of weight. I was spending eight hours a day sitting in a chair working on websites, writing articles, editing programs, and uh, it just became uh, just a problem, and it just finally occurred to me I needed to change. Um, so this is something that we all need to kind of be aware of, and, and think of different ways to encourage patients to be active. One of the things that this article published in The Lancet discussed was that, uh, that they were going to change their approach to recommending activity to their patients. So think about this. Um, if you used to say, hey, you know, remember, it's, you're going to be a lot healthier if you exercise, you know? They're now going with the fear factor thing, and they're going to be talking about, hey, you know what? If you don't exercise, if you don't start getting some activity, you're, it's going to kill you, okay? They're kind of going with the same approach. Uh, it, little bits of activity built up over time and building stamina can make a big difference in patients. So uh, we need to kind of take this article and, and uh, move forward with it and uh, continue to improve and adjust the way that we are recommending healthy lifestyles to our patients and of course ourselves as well. Um, we need to take care of ourselves. What happens when you don't take care of yourself is a challenge. Uh, nurses are often uh, very good at taking care of other people. It's, it's in our blood, right? I mean, nursing is not just a profession, it's a calling. But the flip side of that is we are often taking care of others to our own detriment in some cases, whether, whether it's because we become fatigued, because we work when we're sick and we really shouldn't be going in, or uh, we have injuries to ourselves. In fact, nurses who are the largest segment of the healthcare professions in the workplace are also most likely to have some kind of work-related injury over their career. Uh, a lot of these are lower back injuries from lifting accidents. And of course, what happens when you have those injuries? Well, uh, studies looked at them, uh, looked at this particular problem, found that nurses with injuries were more likely to be depressed, and that nurses with injuries and or depression both 
mind you, not just the injury, but also having depression related to that injury or uh, having depression after the injury is partially recovered from, uh, can lead to lapses in care for those patients. And nurses were surveyed about this and found that during the situations where they were injured, they were distracted, or if they were depressed about an injury or a problem, they were distracted and they were more likely to cause medication errors and uh, have adverse events happen with, when they were caring for patients. So it's something we need to be aware of. Now there's a big problem. This whole picture has got a lot of parts to it. Um, does your facility have lifting policies? Does your facility have list, lifting assistance and aids and tools that can help you lift? Um, there's a hospital near here, Christiana Hospital in Delaware, that has a, a lifting um, lifts in the ceilings in every room to allow them to help move patients so that you're not lifting them in and out of the bed. Uh, you know, the old school nurses out there might uh, say, oh, well, this is going to become a lost start. We're not going to know how to lift patients. Well, we shouldn't have to bend over and lift patients like that. That's the point of this. You can do it when you're young, but eventually you're going to blow your back out and then you're no good for anybody. Um, so, and, and I'm, I'm a prime example of that. I've, I've injured my back a long time ago. Uh, I was a paramedic. It's one of the reasons I got into nursing was because, hey, I couldn't get out there and do the things I used to do when I was a young gun running on the street in an ambulance. I needed to do something different. Um, and and uh, nursing was a little bit easier on the back than what I had been doing. So I was <laughs> improving that way. But it's something to keep in mind. And we need to take care of ourselves and we need to make sure that our facilities have policies in place to take care of us as well. YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Oh, well. Uh, you know, a recent uh, study uh, by a nursing professional in Dublin actually looked at nurses being represented on YouTube videos. And what did they find? They found that nurses were being represented, and I'll quote the study. Our study found that nurses were depicted in three main ways, as a skilled knower and doer, a sexual plaything, and a witless incompetent. Which would you like to be? Uh, in some cases, you might want to be a sexual plaything, <laughs> but I'm sorry, I digress. And you send your emails in the nursing show at gmail.com and yell at me. But um, anyway, uh, as a skilled knower and doer, obviously, uh, he found uh, the top 10 most viewed videos under the heading nurses and nursing uh, had most of them, uh, seven of them in those cases in each category depicted nurses as uh, some kind of a sex object and as some kind of a incompetent or uh, some kind of comedy situation. Uh, and that only three out of the 10 depicted nurses in a positive way and in every case those were done by nurses themselves, recorded by nurses. So uh, what does this mean? Well, first of all, I'd like to say I went and tried to replicate these results. I went on YouTube and looked it up. Uh, maybe YouTube has changed the algorithm to represent nurses better, I don't know. But uh, certainly, uh, it, it, I couldn't find it. And I did find a few videos that were suggestive. Um, they were there, uh, I won't say that. But some of the top videos that showed up, and certainly in the top 10, uh, that that had to do with nurses. Some of them were completely off topic, had nothing to do with nurses, but showed up under the search. Um, I scanned down. Some of them had to do with nursing and nurse as in nursing your baby. Um, so I had to, you know, scroll down. But when I found those topics that dealt with nurses specifically, uh, most of the ones I saw at the top of the list were done by nurses, represented nurses very well, or were student nurses having a little bit of fun and creating a learning video that had a music or segment to it or something, or uh, some of the excellent video segments done by Johnson & Johnson's Campaign for Nursing's Future. Um, they have done a great job of representing nurses out there and encouraging people to thank a nurse and and uh, a lot of you I'm sure have seen those video productions uh, and advertisements that have shown up on television. So uh, those videos are on there. So I. I my experience, when I looked on YouTube, you let me know what you find. Um, I find, found it to be the reverse of what this study showed. And uh, this, this particular article says that they would like to have legislation to require that nurses be represented well. Well, you know, I'm a content creator. I don't want somebody telling me how I present and portray things. What if somebody's offended by my earlier comment about sexual play things? Well, you know, I was talking about myself there, 
but you know, somebody could say misrepresents nurses. So uh, I'd like to have some more control over that and not have this be legislated. I think we're big enough to handle some of the stuff that goes on. And I think despite all of this stuff on YouTube, we are still the most trusted medical profession and uh, that hasn't changed. So I think that this is something we just need to not overreact to. I welcome your comments though. So uh, send those comments in to nursingshow at gmail.com. What do you think of some of the videos you see on YouTube portraying nurses? Time now for this week's skill segment and tip segment. And we're gonna go ahead and get into a return segment with our good friend, Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center. Lisa is our go-to person for information on toxicology and poison control. And she's a great resource. She's the Maryland Poison Center person, but you know what? She can uh, get you hooked up with resources and information no matter where you're from. And they have a free newsletter and information that goes out every month and you can sign up for that. So I urge you to go ahead and do that and check that out. And let's go on and see what Lisa has to share with us this month. Hi, Lisa. It's been a while since we've actually had you on. I, I want to apologize. Usually we try to get you on about you know once every month or every six weeks or so, and uh, the summer just cascaded into a ton of different things. So uh, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks, Jamie. I'm, I'm glad to be back, and I know exactly how it is. Summertime, it's busy for everybody, and um, especially when I think when you're in the healthcare field. I know at the Poison Center, that's our busiest time of the year in the summer, and then you have staff on vacations and whatnot, so it can be pretty hectic. But there are some things going on, so um, you know I'm glad that we're, we're getting back together and talk about some timely topics. So uh, we, we're recording a bunch of different topics today, but the first one that we're going to be doing is, uh, you said, talking about synthetic drugs. I know things like bath salts and some other things have been really in the news here in Maryland as uh, legislation has been enacted recently to, to ban them. Uh, but it still seems to be an issue, and of course there are other drugs and synthetic um, chemicals out there as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it's a problem everywhere, not just in our state. It's these new synthetic drugs are just they're just exploding out there on the market, and we don't know a lot about them. It's, it's difficult for laws to keep up with them. Um, but I, I did want to give an update on those, in, in particular the synthetic marijuana drugs and also the bath salts, but also about a couple of other new synthetic drugs that we're just hearing about. Well, go so, ahead. Okay, great. Um, so I, I think I'd just like to start with the synthetic marijuana uh, products, and I and I did do something on this a while back. So I'll just uh, you know briefly update everyone about about these particular products and what you see when people have been using them, and then also about the laws that have been enacted, and we'll go on from there. But um, synthetic marijuana products are generally sold as herbal incense products, and they, they look like a potpourri type of substance. There, there are a lot of different brand names, Spice, K2, Mr. Nice Guy is also popular in our area, but there are um, tens of dozens of other product names that are out there, and, and there might be even um, uh, region-specific. You know, There might be some products of certain brand names in some areas and other products in other areas. These chemicals were... Um, originally discovered back in the 80s and the 1990s for research purposes. And what the, these people are doing with, with these chemicals is spraying them onto a leafy material or potpourri and then people buy the product and then they smoke it. And it is um, purported to be a synthetic marijuana, but unlike marijuana, these uh, synthetic cannabinoids produce stimulant-like effects. Marijuana makes people kind of mellow. You don't see that with most of these products. You see effects like agitation, tachycardia, hypertension. They often vomit. They have tremors. And then occasionally you can see seizures. It's not very common, but it has occurred. As far as poison center calls, well, from January 1st, 2010, which is um, 2010, is pretty much the first year that we started seeing these products um, pretty widespread. So between January 1st of that year through October 31st of 2011, there have been more than 5,700 calls to poison centers in the United States about exposures to these products. Treatment is basically supportive care, and a lot of these patients do require some sedation with benzodiazepines. Usually, most of these patients do well just by supportive care and, and sedating them a bit. 
So the DEA took notice about all these new drugs and did some investigating. And in March of 2011, they uh, identified five chemicals as being used in most of these synthetic marijuana products, and they designated those chemicals as Schedule I under an emergency ban. So what that means is that for at least a year, any products that contain these five chemicals, and they are JWH-018, JWH-073, CP-47497, JWH-200, and cannabicyclohexanol or illegal. Now, the reason that, um, you know, they're all chemical names, and it's a little bit important to be a little familiar with them because there are other newer products out there that have um, other chemicals in them that are very similar with very similar names. And so um, some of them are legal and some of them aren't. Um, many states have also passed laws, and but we found that with this DEA law as well as the state laws, it still hasn't really stopped the, product, the problem that we're seeing with these products. They're sold um, um, over the internet on websites that um, sell the, the specific product used for this, or they're sold over websites where you can buy the uh, the chemical itself and sprinkle on a on a uh, leafy material. And they state on their websites that they're selling them for research purposes only. Some of the products actually even have statements on them that say not for human consumption, but they also say that they're DEA compliant and do not contain the five banned substances. So they clearly put on the label that, um, that their products are legal because they don't contain those same substances that were made illegal. So what they have in them are other chemicals, other synthetic cannabinoids, but not those named five substances. They're um, easy to obtain in head shops, convenience stores, gas stations, and over the Internet. Now, bath salts is sort of a disguise that's given to products that contain synthetic drugs sold for their stimulant effect. They're not the same as the bath salts we buy in stores that, and put in the bathtub. They're completely different chemicals. They're strictly used for drug abuse. Now, just like the synthetic marijuana products, they're sold over the Internet and in head shops and other small stores. There are a lot of product names also, um, Ivory Wave, White Lightning, Vanilla Sky, or a few of the product names, but again, there are many more that are out there. The same chemicals that are in these bath salts have also been identified in some products sold for other reasons or under other disguises, um, namely plant food, but it's not plant food. It's, it's sold with the ex explicit intent of being used as a drug of abuse. Bath salts contain chemicals that are usually... Uh, uh, tout it to be cocaine or methamphetamine substitutes. They're usually powders or granules, often snort it, but they've also been ingested and smoked and injected. Poison centers have been called more than 5,600 times about bath salts exposures and bath salts toxicity from January 1st, 2010 through October 31st, 2011. Patients have very strong uh, stimulant effects. They have tachycardia, hypertension, hallucinations, seizures, and there have been a number of fatalities. Many of these patients also have become very, very paranoid and agitated after using the drug. And that paranoia and, and sort of psychotic-like effect can last for days. Those psychological effects have actually led to deaths from suicides and, and injuries. Um, so you can have fatalities due to the, the toxicity or the clinical effects and then also fatalities as a result, a result of the psychological effects. Like synthetic marijuana, treatment is, is largely supportive care and sedation with benzodiazepines is often required in these patients because they're so agitated. Uh, a lot of states have passed laws making bath salt substances um, illegal. The DEA also has announced emergency action to ban the chemicals that um, uh, will be taking effect soon. But just as with the synthetic cannabinoids, the laws only include certain chemicals. Now, in most cases, and particularly with the DEA law, that only includes three chemicals, mephedrone, methylone, and another synthetic drug that's called MDPV. Um, but we do expect that there will be other products out there, if not already, that contain other synthetics, and, and they'll be in those products to bypass the laws. Uh, we've also heard about another um, synthetic drug called 2-CE, and that's usually snorted to produce hallucinations. It's similar to LSD, but it also has stimulant effects like ecstasy. So patients will have tachycardia, agitation, hyperthermia, seizures, and deaths can occur. It's not scheduled in the United States, 
but it is um, considered an analog of some other drugs that are illegal. And so it's quite possible that sellers and users could be prosecuted under a what's called a federal analog act. Um, there's a lot of legal loopholes with that, and it's a little difficult to understand, but it, it's possible that uh, they might be able to do something with this particular drug with existing laws. We've also been hearing about a synthetic drug that's been used in Europe, but it seems to be making its way over here to the U.S. It's called Bromo Dragonfly, or sometimes just called Dragonfly. Uh, the name, the slang name, was actually derived from the fact that the chemical stru structure, when you see it drawn out on paper, it looks just like a dragonfly. It's a potent hallucinogen. It has a long duration of action. And uh, there have been cases of seizures, as well as some cases in Europe, of um, people who have had a lot of vasoconstriction problems with the drug. They've had limb ischemia, and it's actually required amputations. In the United States, there were two fatalities in May of 2011 in Oklahoma when the drug was sold as 2CE, so they thought they were getting 2CE, and it was used in extremely high doses. And there were a number of hospitalizations along with those two fatalities. The latest drug that we're hearing about is methoxetamine. It's a ketamine-like synthetic drug. It's only been uh, recently reported to poison centers, only a few cases so far, and there's, uh, I believe, just one case in the literature. Like other synthetic drugs, it's, it's easily accessible over the Internet. It's legal. Um, a recent case report that was published described a patient who used it IM, intramuscular injection, as having tachycardia, hypertension, and agitation. Then he progressed to being in a dissociative type state, almost exactly what you see with ketamine or PCP. Um, so that's pretty much an update of what we're hearing about right now. But these new synthetic drugs are being discovered at a rapid rate. It, it's really difficult to keep up with them currently, and it's it, it's very, very difficult to keep up with them as to making them illegal, you know, laws that, are, that would make some of these chemicals illegal. When you make one chemical illegal, they just go on and alter it a little bit and come up with a new chemical. Um, so you have to do the best that you can to keep up with these new drugs of, of concern. Uh, one way to do that is to call your local poison center. Often we're the first people to hear about these particular drugs. And in the cases of synthetic marijuana and bath salts, it was poison centers that pretty much brought this out into the open to make people aware of the problems with these drugs. So if you suspect use of any of these drugs or you just want information on some of these new synthetic drugs, definitely call your local poison center. And the poison center number in the United States is 1-800-222-1222. And Lisa, it seems to me that this is uh, uh, just an issue that's going to continue to snowball. Uh, I know the Federal Analog Act uh, or law that, that deals with analogs of, of, for, of banned chemicals uh, has a lot of problems with it. And it, it, uh, that, that can't be expected to cover everything. Uh, plus, you know, you and I both know people will try anything if they're deciding that they want to, you know, have an altered state of some sort. <laughs> That's right, and we don't know the toxicity of these drugs. These are not um, drugs that have been around. They're not drugs that have been used for any other purposes, so we just we really don't know the toxicity of these drugs at all until people start using them, unfortunately. Um, and, it, and it is a, a, a problem, like you said, with um, keeping up and, and making these drugs illegal. I, I've talked to numerous law enforcement people who who describe it as chasing their tail, you know, that it's it's almost impossible to cover every single synthetic drug that's out there, and they'll just keep coming up with more. So will, will it ever end, you know, or will there be an end point to how many drugs you can actually make? It, right now it doesn't look that way. How, prevent, how pro, um, effective are uh, public prevention campaigns, uh, education campaigns, to, uh, to speak to the, the target audience of these drugs? I mean, so often I think a lot of these synthetic drugs are really aimed at a youth, a youth marketplace. Um, uh, I, I would think so. I'm, I don't know that for sure, but it seems to me that that's where I, we see a lot of uh, our overdoses, at least anecdotally. Where do we, uh, you know, is there an effect that we can have by doing some public education, talking about the dangers, the toxicities of, you know, trying the latest, greatest thing? It's a little controversial, but in some cases that has been shown to work. And a good example of that is with inhalants. You know, years ago, um, 
inhalants started to become really, really popular in the younger teens or even even younger than teenage age group. And um, there was a lot of education going on to make teens and kids, even as, as early as elementary school, aware that inhalants can be very toxic and can be dangerous. And um, surveys showed that after those education pushes into the schools, the use of those inhalants actually did decrease. And when they asked students, did they perceive those inhalants of being safe or not safe, um, the more that they perceive them to be not safe, the lower the, the usage. So there does seem to be some association. And then, on the other hand, when education stopped with inhalants and this sort of new generation came along, the inhalant use went up again. So, you know, that sort of shows to me that there, there is a use for, for education. Um, as far as the age groups, um, you're right, a lot of it is the young teenagers, particularly the synthetic marijuana. Um, when we've looked at ages of cases reported to our poison center in Maryland, uh, the age group, the teenage age group, 13 to 19, um, by far is the age group that we're using the synthetic marijuana compounds. On the other hand, with bath salts, it seemed to be people in their 20s and 30s that were using that. So it, a little bit, I guess, it depends on the drug, but, um, but certainly I think there probably is a, a role for education. Again, it's controversial, and you will find um, people out there who say that, you know, education hasn't been shown to work, but I think it can go either way. Well, Lisa, as always, thank you very much for bringing this information here to uh, our audience. And uh, we really appreciate the support you and the Maryland Poison Center provide. Um, again, people can find out more about the Maryland Poison Center at mdpoison.com. And of course, don't forget to call that national poison control number. Uh, and that is 1-800-222-1222. Thanks, Jamie. I'll well, talk to you soon. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Nursing Show. Again, I want to thank all of you for checking out the program this week and remind you that if you haven't already done so and you're using an iOS device, an iPhone, an iPad, or something like that, you can download the new podcast app from the App Store. Uh, that's put out by Apple. It has all the podcasts in the iTunes directory in there. And uh, it's a great way to catch your shows without having to plug into your computer all the time and sync. It'll actually download them directly to your advice. To your device, you just go in there and select each show and tell them how many episodes you want it to keep track of and do you want it to download automatically when you're hooked into a Wi-Fi network and it'll do all that for you. It's really a great thing. So uh, check it out and subscribe to The Nursing Show and some of the other great nursing programs out there uh, that you can get a hold of in the iTunes podcast directory. Also, don't forget you can find links to everything discussed in this episode as well as a link to the podcast app all over at nursingshow.com. And of course, the video versions of the show are always available over at nursingshow.tv. You can get us an email at nursingshow at gmail.com. And don't forget to catch up with me on Facebook or Twitter, facebook.com slash podmedic and twitter.com slash podmedic, or become a fan of the nursing show on Facebook and join the conversation over there. And you can click the like button right at the top of the page at facebook.com slash nursing show. That's it for me. I'm Jamie Davis. I'll be back again soon with another episode of The Nursing Show out here every Friday here for you. In the meantime, I would remind you to stay safe and stay tuned here to The Nursing Show. Take care. <laughs>